Hello, welcome to Cardio Flash College, a place to learn cardiology with flash animations. Today, we are going to close a topic we had left pending, and that is the clinical and therapeutic aspects of the atrial septal defects. For that, we come with the collaboration of an international guest, Dr. Paul Rojas de la Cuba, interventional cardiologist of the Hospital Nacional Guillermo Almenara Irigoyen at Lima, Peru. Join us. As you know, in the atrial septal defects are the result of different disturbances occurred during the embryonic development of the heart. These embryonic alterations, just like all special characteristics of each defect, have been previously checked in the opening video of this channel. If you have not watched it, we recommend you do so to keep on watching this one, because today we are focusing on clinical and therapeutic aspects of this matter. Let's begin! As you know, left atrial pressure is higher than right atrial pressure, resulting in continuous flow of oxygenated blood from the left to the right atrium across the defect. The pressure gradient between the two atria and the amount of shunt flow depend upon the size of the defect and the distensibility of the heart cavities. Thus, the volume of blood flow in the pulmonary circulation is greater than that in the systemic circulation and that can be measured by the pulmonary flow to systemic flow ratio, also known as QP, QS. Finally, the increased flow leads to right-sided dilatation and sometimes right ventricular dysfunction, pulmonary artery dilatation, and pulmonary vascularity increment. Most atrial septal defects are small and do not cause symptoms in infancy and childhood. They most commonly come to attention because a murmur is detected on physical examination or as an incidental finding on echocardiogram obtained for other reasons, many of which can close spontaneously over the years. However, it is estimated that most patients with significant shunt flow, QP, QS more than 2 to 1, will become symptomatic and require surgical correction by the age of 40 years. In these cases, clinical manifestations can be atrial arrhythmias, dyspnea, heart failure, and, rarely, stroke due to paradoxical embolization. Finally, pulmonary hypertension and Eisenmenger syndrome is possible, but uncommon currently. Physical findings. The classic physical findings of an atrial septal defect are related to the size and location of the defect, the size of the shunt at atrial level, and the pulmonary arterial pressure. At inspection, there can be found jugular venous dilation, edemas, cyanosis, a chest wall asymmetry in case of Eisenmenger syndrome, at palpation, there can be found a right ventricular beat along the left sternal border and in the subsiphoid area in cases of large left to right shunts. At auscultation, there can be found a fixed splitting of the second heart sound and several heart murmurs, for example, a systolic ejection pulmonary murmur due to an increased blood flow or systolic murmur of mitral regurgitation in patients with primum or secundum defects and mitral disease. On the other hand, the shunt flow across the atrial septal defect has too low velocity and produces too little turbulence to be audible. The electrocardiogram tends to be normal in patients with small atrial septal defects, especially patients with non-complicated secundum septal defects. However, electrocardiogram alterations can sometimes exist, such as leftward shift of the P wave in cases of sinus venous septal defects, first degree atrioventricular block with complete right bundle branch block, and anterior fascicular block in case of primum septal defects, a notch on the R wave in the inferior leads, a pattern called crochetage and atrial arrhythmias, such as flutter and atrial fibrillation. 
On the chest X-ray, we can see dilation of the right cavities and of the pulmonary arteries in patients with large left to right shunts. Transthoracic echocardiography is useful in the diagnosis and assessment of atrial septal defects. Three main transthoracic views can be used in the majority of cases. Peristernal short axis at the level of the aortic valve, apical four-chamber view, and subcostal four-chamber view. Color flow Doppler can confirm the presence, the size, and the direction of an atrial shunt. On the other hand, an intravenous agitated contrasaline injection can be useful to detect interatrial shunting. Finally, the QPQS ratio has been used to measure the hemodynamic impact of atrial septal defects. This is measured by calculating flow across the pulmonary valve and dividing it by the flow across the aortic valve. Being aware that the flow is calculated by multiplying the cross-sectional area of the outflow tract with the time velocity integral. Typically, secundum and primum septal defects can be seen with transthoracic imaging. However, multiplane transesophageal echocardiography may be needed to visualize sinus venosis or coronary sinus defects with certainty. Multiplane transesophageal imaging is highly accurate in visualizing the anatomical relationships and associated anomalies. Magnetic resonance imaging can be helpful in selected cases with suspected associated defects, such as partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection, or in patients in whom there are inconclusive echocardiographic findings. MRI can also provide accurate quantification of ventricular volumes and of pulmonary and systemic flow. A right heart catheterization can be useful in patients with atrial septal defects. It should include blood sampling from the right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, superior vena cava, and inferior vena cava. Thus, detection of an oxygen saturation step up, which means more than 10%, allows confirmation of the shunt and determination of its location, because the site of the step up defines the level of the shunt. On the other hand, the degree of left to right shunting can then be quantified by calculating a ratio of pulmonary flow to systemic flow. Furthermore, it is important to know the pressures of the pulmonary artery, the cardiac output by fixed method, and pulmonary vascular resistances. Finally, in patients with pulmonary hypertension and left to right shunting, a temporal occlusion of the interatrial communication with a balloon catheter can be performed to determine the reaction of the systemic and pulmonary arteries pressure. In this way, the closure of the defect could be proposed if pulmonary pressures decrease and the cardiac output increases. Very well, after this little review of the clinical aspects of the interatrial septal defects, we only need to know when and how to treat these cases. Schematically, we can divide our patients in two big groups, the ones that have significant pulmonary hypertension and the others that do not. Considering that significant pulmonary hypertension exists when systolic pressure of the pulmonary artery surpasses the 50% of the systemic arterial pressure and the pulmonary resistances surpass a third of the systemic vascular resistances. Let's begin with the patients that do not have significant pulmonary hypertension. In these cases, we consider the closure of the interatrial defect when there are clear symptoms such as dyspnea, platypnea, orthodeoxia syndrome, or paradoxical embolisms, or when, independently of the symptoms, it is evident that there is a clear hemodynamic repercussion, QPQS is more than 1.5, or there is dilation of the right cavities. Let's see now what to do with the patients that do have significant pulmonary hypertension. In these cases, we must know that not all patients should be treated because it all depends on the existence or not of a reversible pulmonary hypertension. Generally speaking, closing interatrial septal defects is recommended only in those patients that have significant pulmonary hypertension with systolic pressure and pulmonary vascular resistance less or equal to two-thirds of the systemic counterparts. Otherwise, patients should be considered subsidiary of medical treatment. 
Regarding therapeutical strategy, we can say that in general, osteum secundum types of defect used to be treated with percutaneous devices, while heart surgery is the best option in the rest of the interatrial communications because percutaneous closure devices are unstable in these locations and can embolize, damaging the mitral valve functioning or compromising venous return. In this way, and taking advantage of our dedication to the interventional cardiology, let's go to the hemodynamic room to see how we percutaneously treat the osteum secundum type of interatrial septal defects. Prior to puncturing the femoral vein, a J guide is sailed to the right atrium and, posteriorly, on this guide, a multipurpose catheter is introduced. With the help of fluoroscopy and transesophageal echocardiography, catheter is oriented towards the interatrial septum and the J-guy is advanced through the septal defect. After anchoring the guide inside one of the pulmonary veins, catheter is removed and a release sheath is introduced. This one moves on the J-guide until arriving to the left atrium. Once the sheath is in position, the introducer and the J-guide are removed. Just immediately after, percutaneous closure device is mounted. This is a device made with a fine mesh of nitinol and disposed in a way that there are two parallel discs united by a neck. The neck is located in the defect and each one of the discs stays in an atrium, sealing the communication. Besides, this device usually contains polyester in its interior with the intention of easing thrombosis and the total occlusion of the septal defect. The device is liberated in three steps. The first one consists in expanding the disc located in the left atrium. The second step looks for the correct position of the disc on the left wall of the interatrial septum. And the third step consists on deploying the right disc. As you can see, the device is screwed to a release cable and the set can be moved in any sense with the intention of evaluating the correct position of it through echocardiography and fluoroscopy. When the device reaches an optimal position, its definitive release is performed. Then, the final result can be easily evaluated through echocardiography and, even if necessary, three-dimensional reconstruction of the device can be carried out. The procedure is considered successful when the device remains stable without residual leak, nor compromise of the valvular functioning, nor the venous return. Finally, after implanting the device, it is necessary to remind that, even though thrombosis of it is infrequent, consequences can be disastrous. Because of this, different authors recommend a proper antithrombotic treatment guideline and an echocardiographic following during the first six months. The regular dual anti-aggregation therapy is regularly made with aspirin and clopidogrel during the first three months and then aspirin alone the following three months. Continuing with aspirin beyond the first semester or considering at any moment the treatment with anticoagulant drugs will depend on the clinical cardiologist and the peculiarities of each patient. As you saw, interatrial septal defects have a lot to talk about and even though we thought it would take three videos, we have achieved closing it in only two and just in time because our time is over. It has been all for today in Cardio Flash College. We hope you liked the video. If so, subscribe to the channel and leave a like. We'll see you in the next class. And remember, don't come late. Bye.